I'm on, I don't, I am on. I'm on. My green light's here, so I know I'm on. You got me? <laughs> We're blessed not to have a lot of turnover, and uh, that's a good thing. We, in fact, uh, Miss Gwen and Miss Wendy, uh, Gwen, where's Miss Gwen? How long have you been with us, Miss Gwen? What year did you start here? 34 years. Uh, Miss Wendy started in the 80s. What, Greg, when did y'all come in 80 what? 85 until now. And, and, and Pardon? Wow. And uh, we, we, we uh, moved her over to Riverside, so we recycled and we don't let them get away. Miss Valerie talked, really seriously, Miss Valerie went away with us from us a long time, and when she came back near us, we snagged her again, put her back to work. So we're thankful. We, yes, ma'am? Miss Norma, Norma, where's Miss Norma at? There she is. You were hiding behind Mr. Don there. I couldn't see you. Miss Norma been with us from almost day one and uh, went away for a while, but we always snag them back if we can because... That's right, amen. She was. She, how many years did you teach totally for us? I can't remember. Twenty-seven with us, yeah. With God, God's good. If we get a get a good teacher, we try to hold on to them, amen. And uh, we and we we're always looking for dedicated, qualified, godly teachers like we have, and and hope we can hold on to them. And uh, pray for those that are that are with us. Some of them are or uh, moving up in their education, trying to do some classes online, that sort of thing. Pray for those because they're trying to work and go to school. And that, those of you that have done that, that's pretty hard. So pray for them that, that that will work out for them and do well. I want to speak for just the next few minutes on who is this challenging child in my classroom and really an encouragement to you uh, not to give up on those that aren't the straight-A students in your class. Because you're going to have some, how many of you remember there are some that are like teacher's pets that are always do everything right? Y'all know that, right? How many of y'all were that student? One, you got one, two. I wasn't that student. If you'd had me in my class, you probably wondered why in the world have I got him in my class? You're going to have some students that just don't fit the mold of being the good student. And, and, as I challenge you today at the beginning of our school year to, uh, as you get those kids in your classroom and you're going, if I could just get rid of that one or that one, if I could just don't only have a class of three or four or ten like this, I'd have a much better, easier life. Well, that's probably true. But God has brought that particular child to you for right now for a reason. And see, God has a secret plan for impacting our culture. And it's in a lot of times he uses those <laughs> sometimes we call them the bad students, the bad kids, the bad students, you know, the ones that weren't quite the student they ought to be. None of you were like that, I guess. Y'all were all... If you were like me and you weren't the best student in the world at school and you might have been delegated to that side, put your hand up for a minute. Let me see. Okay, I'm, I'm in good company. So there's a few of us out there. And aren't you glad? Aren't you glad God didn't throw us away? And aren't you glad God is using us today in spite of the fact we weren't that great of students? And, and I, I've still got, I didn't bring them with me, but I still have some of my early elementary report cards that my mama saved. And needless to say, there weren't a lot of A's on there. There were maybe once in a great while a B, but there were a lot of C's. And, and there were notes on there from the teacher. What do you suppose those notes would say when... An, Back in those days, a teacher would write on the side of the report card, Billy would be a better student if he wouldn't talk so much, and Billy would be a better student if blah, 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 and there's this list of stuff, you know. And, and the teacher was telling the truth, and I didn't fail, but I was in that category being that child, and who is this challenging child in my classroom? And we have how many students, Brother Jody, where are you at? 340, that's a lot of kids. That's a lot of people to look after, isn't it? And Miss, Miss uh, Kayla, how many you got in the preschool? You know all fan? 45 or 50, but know this for sure. When we get that many kids, you're going to end up with some that just don't, don't fit the mold of being a good student, okay? And frequently, parents that have had trouble in the other system bring their children to us because the other system has failed them. 
and it hadn't worked for them. And they come to us with a almost desperation, can you help us? Now, we're not a reform school, and we don't take kids that have been in trouble. That's not our, we're not, we're not, that's not our school, okay? Our school is designed to train future leaders. Children of Christian parents that love the Lord, and they want their children to turn out to be good leaders one day. Number one, they know Christ. Number two, that they are, have some character. Y'all know what character is? Not being like I was. I was a character. And like you, some of you were character. No, I'm not talking about that. Character is what you are when nobody's watching it. So we hope to build that through the Word of God and through mentoring and through counseling and through the different things we do. We hope to build Christian character into your young person. So teachers, I'm, aim I'm talking to you today. I'm going to let the rest of them sit in on, on this. But as we think about who this challenging child is in our classroom, I want to go back in Scripture just a minute, back into Exodus when you'll, you'll remember the story once I start reading it. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 15, Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shephra and Pua. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. <laughs> and if it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this? He demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women, they replied, are not like the Egyptian women. The, the midwives replied, they're more vigorous and have their babies so quickly, we can't get there in time. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives fear God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. Think about that. Down through history, governments have attacked children. This is one of the times. Can you think of another time in the New Testament that the children were attacked and babies were killed? Yeah, time of Jesus, right? Can you think of a time in our lifetime where babies have been attacked and killed? Oh, yeah, since 1973. Thank, thank you, Jesus, that Roe versus Wade was overturned. We've been working for this since 1973. And yet, I think of the millions of little babies that were murdered during this time. And who knows and how many of those were God has sent to the earth to do something great, and yet our idiocy and the people that run our, the power mongers that are behind the scenes, uh, the, uh, as Ephesians calls them, the, the principalities and powers behind the scene, have colluded with the government authorities and they murdered babies like they have all through history. This is a picture from long ago during Exodus when it happened. Exodus 2 says, About this time a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant, gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby, kept him hidden for three months. I think all babies are special, don't you? Raise your hand if you believe that. Amen. All babies are special. This was a special baby. She hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket, laid it among the reeds along the river of the Nile, the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister then stood at a distance, watching to see what would happen to him. What do you think would happen to him in the Nile full of crocodiles? Well, why do you think Pharaoh said, throw all the baby boys into the Nile? Well, he knew they would, they would not only drown, they'd be gobbled up quickly because it's full of crocodiles. So she did throw him in the Nile, but she put him in a little boat. Okay, So she wasn't totally disobedient, but she disobeyed the edict of the Pharaoh and, and did what God told her to do. Verse 5, soon, after, soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the water, a river, and her tendant walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. 
When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Isn't that weird how God turns things around and he makes even the government do his bidding? uh, A God-hating, Christ-rejecting government, he turns it around and makes them do carry the load and pay the bill. Isn't that crazy? So the princess said, take this baby and nurse him for me. And the princess told the baby's mother, I'll pay you for your help. <laughs> so the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, the mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him, him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she exclaimed, I lifted him out of the water. <laughs> Listen, there's, a, there's something here for y'all. And for us. It's not just a story from three or four thousand years ago. Listen, there's something here for us. There's something here for that troubling child that you've got in your classroom. You haven't even learned your classrooms yet, Harley. You've had one week. But there's going to be some kids in there. You're going to wonder, why in the world did I get them? God has a plan, okay? He's got a secret plan for impacting our culture. So let's start with prayer and and ask for God's help. I want you to understand this and God to drive this home to your heart like he has in my heart. You ready? Lord, I ask you today that you'll come down here and uh, Lord, in your powerful Holy Spirit, Lord, I, I know you're already here. Lord, you live in each one of us believers. Thank you for being here in that regard. But Lord, I pray you'll unleash your power today on the minds and hearts of especially our teachers. Lord, and help them to see how they're being used in your great plan for impacting our culture through these little boys and girls that are coming our way, Lord, and particularly a lot of times the ones that don't act right. So, Lord, help us not to ever give up on them. Help us not to ever reject them. Help us not not to ever discourage them with our words and our, our facial expressions and how we treat them. But, Lord, we'll do our best to raise them up in your nurture and your admonition. And, Lord, help turn them into some God-fearing, sin-hating, Satan-fighting adults when they grow up one day. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. When I was principal for 13 years here, we had, we had a lot of kids that would fall into this category. And many times the teachers would say, I don't know why you took that kid. Or why did you take this kid, you know? And, and I would always try to take them back to the fact that when, when parents come and they, they appeal to us, we need help. <laughs> And the Lord, we pray about it, and the Lord tells us, take that kid, and we take them. We don't do it lightly. We do it because God has told us to do this. God has put us in this, this uh, life-changing, child-rearing, uh, adult-raising, <laughs> or little baby adults is what they are, right? You know what a puppy is, don't you? What's a puppy? It's a baby dog, isn't it? Okay. What is a child? They're baby adults, Okay. And, and we are so blessed to have them in our tutelage, in our care, and under our, our umbrella for 12 years a lot of times, sometimes 13, 14 years if they go to preschool here. So God has put us in a powerful place, and, and he's, he's endowed us with certain wonderful gifts to be able to do these things in the lives of these children. See, some children are hard to deal with. Some children are hard to figure out. Some children are, are hard to motivate. Uh, but teachers and monitors and helpers don't give up on the ones that are hard to deal with. Don't give up on the ones that are hard to figure out. Don't give up on the ones that are hard to motivate. Don't give up on the ones that are the least likely to succeed. Please don't give up on them. The bright kids and the straight A kids are going to make it no matter where you throw them, okay? You can throw them anywhere you throw them. They're going to land on their feet and they're always going to do great. Anybody can educate a child like that. And when a person says, well, look at my child, and and, and all they have is straight A kids, and they act like, I did that. No, they didn't do that. That child was already gifted, if you use that word the world used today. They're going to make it anywhere. 
But when you can take a child that is the least likely to succeed and you can help them and you can motivate them and, and they turn out and do something great in the world one day and, and God can use them in a powerful way, then toot your horn a little later on. They say, I, I helped train that child when he was a little boy. <laughs> when you're old and gray one day, you can look at the result of your ministry. See, in challenging times all through history, God sent a child. All through history, he always sends, it, he always sends his deliverers as children to begin with. He don't send them as adults. They come into the world as children. And so what is a child? He's a what? He's a baby adult. Okay. What's a puppy? That's a baby dog. You know, what's a what's a little baby monkey? He's he's gonna be a monkey one. But when we get a child, they're human, and hopefully, if the Lord lets them live and we're able to tutor them, tutor tutor them and teach them and grow them, they're gonna be adults one day. And hopefully they have the philosophy of life that's that's not based on humanism like a lot of us were raised in, in the public school system. I, I was a secular humanist till I got my second year, of, third year of college. Raised a secular humanist because I went through public school system. So I had a lot of unlearning to do to learn Christian character and Christian teachings and, and theology and that sort of thing. But in challenging time, God sent a child. All through history of the world, God sent a child to help when things got really bad on the earth. You might remember Adam and Eve, and they had, how would you like this if you were the parents? The first child born, the first two children born, you're the mom and dad. One of them kills the good one. So you're the parents of a murderer, basically. That'd make you feel real good, wouldn't it? The fact you walk with God every day, and yet you, you parented like that. Now, would you think Adam and Eve would feel successful or unsuccessful? They would be thinking, oh my gosh, we're not very good at this parenting deal. You know, raised two and one of them turned out to be bring the first murder to the earth, killed his brother, you know. But, but the cool thing is, right after that, the scripture records that God gave Eve another son. Remember his name? Seth. Seth came into the world in Genesis Chapter 4 said, Adam had relations with his wife again. She gave birth to another son. She named him Seth. For she said, God has granted me another son in the place of Abel, whom Cain killed. When Seth grew up, he had a son named Enosh. Now listen to this. At that time, people first began to worship the Lord by name. The fact God, here's it, it's messed up. Mankind fell into sin, you know, and Satan seemed to have won. No, he didn't. No. God already had a better plan. He sends another one. He sends a replacement son named Seth. And people begin to call on the name of the Lord. Then you look a little later on, there was Noah. The Bible says Noah found, uh, the whole earth was gone wicked, yet Noah came along. God, he says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And through Noah, the rest of history came to be. Because there were only eight of them left after the flood. And Noah was a daddy. So God sent Noah. Then he sent Joseph. Then he sent Moses. Then he sent Samson. Then he sent David. Then he sent John the Baptist. And then later on he sent Jesus. And all through history, he's done it through children. Because each one of those came, not as a full-grown adult, but as a child. Now I remember when, when Samuel went to anoint David. I don't know if you remember this. But Sam, God told him, go anoint Jesse's house and anoint you know the king and Jesse brings all the big strong handsome boy had a bunch of boys you girls would have loved them met them all they were handsome and strong and warriors and good looking you know I'm headed all going for them and he brought all those sons before Samuel and he said nope not that one not that one not that one not that one and in in uh, first Samuel but the Lord said to Samuel don't judge by his appearance or his height for I've rejected him the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He's, he said, Jesse, is this all you got? He said, what do you mean is all I got? Look at these guys. They're awesome. He said, no, I got one more. You know, he's out there, little kind of shepherd boy out there taking care of sheep, you know. And he said, well, I'm not going, we're not going to eat till we see him. I want you to see him. And we walked in little old. Ruddy David, he said, ruddy looking, rough looking, you know. The Lord said, that's him, knowing him. 
And you know the rest of the story. David became the great king, one of the greatest kings. That's ever. In fact, during the millennium, you might not know this, David is going to rule with Christ. Christ's going to rule the whole earth. David's going to rule in Jerusalem. He's going to be raised back. I can't wait to meet Uncle Mr. Mr. King David. Can you? So many stories about him in the Bible. But see, we look at the outward appearance. We look at their performance. So many times if a child doesn't perform well in school, we don't think they're worth much. If they're not a good athlete, we don't think they're worth much. If they don't look good, if they're not handsome or pretty, we don't think they're worth much. That's, I say we, our culture. Our culture does not value people for who they are and who God made them to be. He values them for how they look, how they perform, and if they make good grades, you know, and the ones in the public school that have good grades, oh, they're gifted, right? They label them gifted. They get special privileges. They get perks that the other kids don't get. Then, then some of them are labeled special needs kids, ESE. They put them on the short bus, and they push them into these classrooms, and they treat them different, don't they? Now, are they any less valuable? Is this group more valuable than this group? No. But see, if we're not careful, we can adopt that kind of mindset when we get a problem kid or a kid that that is acting up in class and he's not being what he ought to be, we can easily push them into a label or begin to say, okay, that one's, I wish I could get rid of that one. He's not going to turn out. You don't know that. You don't know that. <laughs> you don't know what God is going to do in that child's life. I wouldn't be here today if, if Mr. Wilkerson, my sixth grade teacher, hadn't taken an interest in me. I was struggling in life and in school. And I was going the wrong direction. He was an old military, retired military pilot. And for some reason, because of, I know why now, God did it. For some reason, Mr. W my teacher, Mr. Wilkerson, saw something in me nobody else saw. And he took me off to the side and talked to me and encouraged me not to give up on life, not to go the way I was going, but try to accomplish something. Now, he wasn't even a Christian. And yet God used this lost pilot from a pilot in World War II to influence a little sixth grader, Lake Forest Elementary School, to turn around and go the other way. And I'm so thankful I had a teacher that cared because before that I'd have Mrs. Haney and others I won't even name that were not good teachers and I'd, I had really come to the point where I hated school and I hated being humiliated in front of the classroom. See, that's where lockstep learning miserably fails because you, you humiliate kids and you give them Fs and you put them in front of the class and they can't do the work and you make them feel bad. Man, I, I just said, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with this until Mr. Wilkerson came into my life. Well, I was glad to have met him. In Exodus, God sent his deliverer in a basket covered with tar, didn't he? Isn't that cool? Uh, he survived. He, was, he survived because there were some godly parents that defied the government during that time. God has the ultimate sense of humor <laughs> when the government, in fact, not only the government, but the, the king or the Pharaoh's daughter ended up feeding him and Sending him to school herself, raising him as her own son. Isn't God smarter than the world? God moved her feminine instincts, the Pharaoh, you know, princes, to defy her father and the whole government and raise this Hebrew boy as her own. She defied the rules because of, number one, God put, I think it's in all, all females have this mama, mama instinct, whether you, you can deny it if you want to. But God's put something in y'all. When you hear the cry of a baby, you act different than we do. Why? Because God raised you that way. And he, he used that in Moses' life. And she paid, you know, she paid his own parents to feed him, take care of him too. Isn't that wild? In the New Testament times, God sent a baby in a manger. Think about it. The world was lost and in sin and in... Uh, Galatians 4, 4, it says, it, it all happened at just the right time. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, 
as a tiny baby. 1 John 4, 4 says, the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. <laughs> he sent a baby to do it. I'm thinking, what? Isn't that wild to know God sent a little child to do that? And the king of that day tried to kill Jesus by killing all the boy babies that were two years and younger. He was trying to figure it out. Yet Jesus was protected just like Moses was. And Genesis 3.15 was the first prophecy about the Messiah and about Jesus and came true, you know. The seed of the woman would bruise Satan's head at some point. And here it happened because God sent his baby, his boy, his son in a manger. In our times, God is sending thousands of children to our Christian schools. All over America, their parents like you and others that are here today that have sent their children to us to educate. They, they've seen what the government has done. They've seen what the world has done, and they don't want that. They want something different. They want a Christ-centered education. And they've sought us out, and they brought their children to our doors. And like Moses, Mama, <laughs> we have prepared a basket to save the children. Our school is, a, is the tar basket of our time to save the children from the world's harm that they're trying to do to kids. And in opposition to the God-hating humanist of our time, we have defied their status quo. We will not do what they tell us to do. We will not send our kids to their system. We want to educate our own children from a godly point of view. And we're training someone that is very important to the future of America. You know what I believe. I believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ that he could come at any moment. But what if he doesn't come for 500 years? What if America's got a, a couple hundred years more to go and we're going to be around for that long? What are we going to do in the meantime? Well, in the meantime, I'm going to live as if he's going to come in the next five minutes, but I'm going to work as if he's not coming for 2,000 years. I'm going to work and work and work to provide a place of safety for children like we're doing now. We're training someone that will not be brainwashed by the other system. We're training future world changers. We're training those that God will use to save America should he tarry. Because God raises up deliverers in every generation. See, you're teaching and mentoring the next deliverers. Think about it. You're training and mentoring them. And it, and it very well could be that problem, kids, you got. Your school is a little, is, is like the basket that Moses floated above the crocodile-filled Nile in. Like Moses' sister, you're guarding the basket with the child inside. You're the one standing in the way of those who might harm or pervert the child inside. You don't read the paper these days without every other, at least every month, reading of a teacher that's in trouble for molesting children or something like that. Or being in, you know, locked up for doing stuff they ought not to do with children and saying things they ought not to do, with, in fact, <laughs> locally. One of our former students goes to a, a public, his son goes to a public school, got a note, came home, and it said, Please let us know what pronoun you want to be addressed by. He, her, him, you know, all those. And, uh, oh, wait, let me have my phone, Miss Vonnie. I won't give you the name, but I want to I read you. You won't believe it. You will believe this when you see it or hear it. Thank you, sweetheart. That's my girlfriend, by the way. <laughs> Met in the sixth grade. Fifth, I was in sixth. She was in fifth. At church, good place to meet your, meet your spouse. Let me pull this up and read this to you because you, you need to hear this. And, and, and I'll tell you the reason why in just a moment. Okay. Look up his name. Beep, 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 beep. Said, uh, give your name. He put his name. Name you want me to call you in class. Name. Then he has... Questions. What pronoun would you like to use? Ba 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 ba. 
one of the ones says, Could, would you like to meet with me after school and talk about these pronouns and talk about your choice? Do y'all know what that's called? It's called grooming. And here's a teacher in a local public school doing that. And here's what the, what the father wrote. Please do not include my child in this perversion. Thank you. Put his name and phone number. <laughs> he didn't stop there. Called the school board superintendent. Showed it to him. Superintendent didn't know about it. It was immediately pulled all, and retrieved from class. And that person, the teacher that did that, was relieved. There is hope for America when good people stand up and, and do what they should do and say what they should do. You know, you know who the daddy was? <laughs> he was one of the problem kids we had. Yeah, raised by a single parent, fought all the time, and just aggravating to deal with. Yet, we loved him, adopted him basically as our own. In fact, back then, they can't, you can't do it now, but I'd take them out in the field out there and I'd put boxing gloves on, let them box and wrestle, get it out of their system. We'd, we wouldn't let them get hurt, but we'd let them just duke it out a little bit, you know, get some of that energy. But he played sports for us, went to school here. Miss, I won't, Gwen knows who I'm talking about. I won't tell you who it was. But <laughs> guess what? He's a warrior against evil now. <laughs> we had him for, I don't know, four years. And, and he was taught the right thing. And guess what? He caught it. He caught, <laughs> education is caught more than it's taught, okay? And he caught what we were saying. Now he's raising his kids like that. Now, of course, I'd like to have his kids over here so they can go to you know, our public school. I mean, our public school and our, our school. But the fact he's making a difference over there in that one, you know. And he was one of our ones that if the teachers had that choice, they'd have put that boy out. But I was a principal. I said, no, we're going to keep that boy. But I could see potential in him and just loved him. He didn't have a daddy. And I loved him like I was his daddy. And when I was his, co I was his coach in three sports, and see, coaches have an impact too. We can impact our young people like that, and he's one of them. See, we're mentoring the, the next deliverers of, of this generation, and we might not see it in our lifetime. We might not see it if they move to another area, but that's just one instance locally. Another one, <laughs> this is weird. This is crazy. Little chubby youngin, about that tall, and he was 13, 14 by then, and he was had been put out of every school over there in that particular county, sent home with a note, you know, keep, keep him home. He, you know, he's just too much trouble. We can't deal with it. Can't deal with it. He'd give him Ritalin at school. He'd put it under his tongue, and then he'd ask for permission to go to the bathroom. He'd spit it out, flush it. That's not, too, that's not a dumb 13-year-old, 12, 13-year-old. He's a pretty smart boy. He said, I'm not taking drugs for anybody. That was pretty good philosophy, wasn't it? I, I saw his parents went to my church down there. I said, and I approached him. I said, if you'll let me have him for a while and let, me, let him go to school with me, I think, I think we can help you. So he rode with me from Levy County over here to Countryside for about four years. Before he started driving, I think, his senior year. His senior year, he ran for office as a city council member in Otter Creek, Florida. He was the youngest city council member in the United States at that time. Now, grown man, got six children of his own. He's the second term county commissioner in Levy County. And he was the one that was sent home from all those public schools. We can't help your kid. You come get your kid. He's a problem. They were dead wrong. I only had to, we, back then we paddled, I only paddled that boy one time, I remember. And he, him and the other boy I was talking about, it was him and him and a few others, had, all of them got paddlings that day. Fighting, I think they were fighting in the bathroom or something, but, but he, he caught it, okay? See, education is caught more than it's taught, okay? 
by, by the way we mentor and love them and, and help them go along. Uh, there's a story that you might have read, and I, I read it first time in Chicken Soup for the Soul, and I want to read it to you. And, and it's the title of it, uh, the Teddy Stoddard story, if you've never heard it. Teddy Stoddard stayed after school that day just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, you smell just like my mom used to. Back up. Wrong side. Here we go. There's a story many years ago of an elementary teacher named Mrs. Thompson, and as she stood in front of her fifth grade class on the first day of school, she told the children a lie. Like most teachers, she looked at her students and said she loved them all the same. But that was impossible because there in the front row, slumped in his seat, was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. Mrs. Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play well with other children, that his clothes were messy, that he constantly needed a bath, and Teddy could be unpleasant. He got to the point where Mrs. Thompson would actually take delight in marking his papers with broad red pen, making bold X's and putting a big F at the top of his papers. At the school where Mrs. Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's past records, and she put Teddy's off until last. However, when she reviewed his file, she was in for a surprise. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and has good manners. He is a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, well-liked by his classmates, but he is troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and his life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, His mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest and his home life will soon affect him if some steps aren't taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes sleeps in class. By, by now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem and she was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when the students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful ribbons and bright paper, except for Teddy's. His present was crumb, clumsily wrapped in the heavy brown paper he got from a grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of perfume. But she stifled the children's laughter when she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy Stoddard stayed after school that day just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to. After the children left, she cried for at least an hour. On that very day, she, she quit teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Instead, she began to teach children. Mrs. Thompson paid a tick particular attention to Teddy. As she worked with him, his mind seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. And by the end of the year... Teddy had become one of the smartest children in the class. And despite her lie that she would love all the children the same, Teddy became one of her teacher's pets. <laughs> a year later, she found a note under her door from Teddy telling her that she was still the best teacher he'd ever had in his whole life. Six years went by. Before she got another note from Teddy, he wrote that he had finished high school, third in his class, and she was still the best teacher he had ever had in his whole life. Four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he'd stayed in school, had stuck with it, and soon graduated from college with the highest of honors. He had assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still his, the, the best and favorite teacher he'd ever had in his whole life. Then four more years passed, and another letter came. This time, <laughs> he explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go a little further. The letter explained that she was still the best teacher he'd ever had, but now his name was a little longer. The letter was signed, Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. <laughs> the story doesn't stay in there. You see, yet there was another letter that spring. Teddy said he had met his, this girl and he was going to be married and explained that his father had died a couple of years ago and he was wondering if Mrs. Thompson might agree to sit in the place at the wedding that was usually reserved for the mother of the group. 
Of course, Mrs. Thompson did. And guess what? She wore that bracelet. <laughs> the one with several rhinestones missing. And she made sure she was wearing the perfume that Teddy remembered his mother wearing on their last Christmas together. They hugged each other and Dr. Stoddard whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, Thank you, Mrs. Thompson, for believing in me. Thank you for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a difference. Miss Thompson, with tears in her eyes, whispered back. She said, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You were the one that taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. Who is this troubled child in your classroom? We don't know, do we? I, I don't know if you read our daily bread, but this was in the, our daily bread. I already knew this, and it was part of the sermon, but it just happened to pop up this week. But Thomas Edison was sent home in the second grade with a note pinned to his, his shirt. Keep Tommy home. He's too dumb to learn. And then the Daily Bread wrote it this way. It said, seven-year-old Thomas Edison didn't like or do well in school. One day he was even called addled or mentally confused by a teacher. He stormed home. After speaking with a teacher the next day, his mom, a teacher by training, decided to teach Thomas at home. Helped along by her love and encouragement and his God-given genius, Thomas went on to become a great inventor. Of course, one of the greatest inventors in American history. He later wrote, he later wrote, my mother was the making of me. She was so true, so sure of me, and, and I felt I had someone to live for, someone I must not disappoint. Sister teachers and brother teachers that are here today, don't give up on that challenging child in your classroom. He or she might just be God's great leader who will bring our nation back to him one day. Don't give up or doubt the life-molding power of God's Word that we pour into them every day. Your mentoring influence, your love and care of that child, those encouraging words that you give them. On every single child God brings into your classroom because they're not here by accident. Countryside Christian School didn't just happen. It's here about planned objective by some godly leaders back in 1973 and 74. Now we have one in Trenton. We have one here. Started one in Otter Creek. Within a year, we'll have one at Hawthorne. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? We're doing this because we are that basket of tar in our generation. We're saving children from what the government is trying to do to them. And you're the cutting edge of our ministry. You, every one of you teachers is cutting edge for this church. You might go to another church. You're still part of this church because this is your ministry here. If you think it's a job and that it's only a job to you, then we probably ought to, you ought to let us help you find someplace else to be. But it's if ministry to you, we want you. Keep doing what you're doing. And let's make a difference in our generation. Amen? Who is that troubling child in your classroom? Just might be the next deliverer. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for these wonderful teachers and these uh, monitors and the helpers and the, and the support workers of our school, our staff. Thank you so much, so much, so much. Thank you for their families, Lord. Thank you for their husbands and their children that are supporting them. So, Lord, I pray that you will give them encouragement this year that you have a great plan for them. And every student that comes our way, there's a reason they're here. Help us not to, to uh, push them off to the side and say, if I just could get rid of that one. Help us to know they're in there for a reason. And God wants to change their lives through us. Give us the power and the strength to do that. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming today. And uh, we'll see you soon. Amen. Don't forget to vote on Tuesday.